While there are many well-known Roman emperors, Nero may be one of the most infamous. He became emperor in 54 CE at the young age of 16 and went on to become a notoriously cruel and debauched leader. Nero was emperor when Boudicca rebelled in Britain and was the last of the Julio-Claudian emperors. Many stories about Nero come from historians writing in the time of the next line of emperors, the Flavians, who had an ulterior motive for portraying the Julio-Claudians in a bad light. So how much of what we know about Nero is true? And why did he burn Rome to the ground? Nero was born in 37 CE to Gnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus and his first cousin, Julia Agrippina, also known as Agrippina the Younger. Agrippina was the sister of Caligula and the great-granddaughter of Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. Both of Nero's parents were related to Augustus, so he had a solid claim to power. Perhaps because of this, when Nero was two, his mother was exiled after reportedly being involved in a failed coup against her brother Caligula. Agrippina was sent to an island in the Mediterranean after being found guilty of being an adulterer and a conspirator. Around the same time, Emperor Caligula was assassinated. Agrippina became a widow when Nero's father died. The new emperor, her uncle Claudius, allowed Agrippina to return to Rome. Agrippina was nothing if not ambitious and married an influential and wealthy man whom she was rumored to have poisoned to inherit his money and status. Agrippina knew her position was perilous, as her son was the only male direct descendant of Augustus. The only way she could secure her and her son's future was to become Empress of Rome. To do that, she had to marry her uncle. Initiating this marriage was no mean feat, and Claudius had to change the rules about incest in order to make his niece his bride. Once she was Empress, she ruled jointly alongside Claudius and even managed to persuade him to favor her son over his own. To cement Nero as Claudius' heir, he was married to Claudius' daughter, Octavia. Nero's rise to power left a lot of bodies in its wake and Agrippina was suspected of poisoning anyone who opposed her, possibly even Claudius himself, until she finally maneuvered her son into the position of emperor in 54 CE. Agrippina then quickly eliminated anyone she felt had opposed her in the past, and it's likely that her main aim was to rule as regent for the young emperor. Traditionally, the mother of the emperor had barely got a mention, but inscriptions were made that proclaimed Nero to be the son of Agrippina, and in one relief, she can be seen crowning her son. Coins from the first year of Nero's reign showed joint portraits of Agrippina and Nero, and one even featured Agrippina alone on the obverse side. It seemed Agrippina finally had the power she had worked so hard to get. However, two of the men she had installed, Sextus Afranius Burrus and Lucius Aeneas Seneca, had other ideas. They influenced the young Nero to step out of his mother's shadow and act independently of her surreptitiously supplanting Agrippina's influence with their own. And by 56 CE, Agrippina was made to retire. Growing up in this environment, it seems inevitable that Nero would be a power-hungry monster. However, his first years in power suggest he was quite the opposite, at least at first. Nero ended the practice of secret trials before the emperor and limited the influence of corrupt freed men that had caused much criticism of his predecessor, Claudius. He also allowed the Senate more independence, and his government reduced taxes, banned capital punishment, and allowed enslaved people to formally complain if they were treated unjustly. Nero himself took a far less murderous approach than his mother and stepfather, pardoning people who plotted against him or criticized his rule. However, as effective as Nero's government was, he was a typical teenager and soon engaged in hedonistic activities which caused a scandal just two years into his reign. From there, Nero's personality begins to prove that the apple does not fall far from the tree. In 55 CE, Nero fell in love with a former slave named Claudia Acti. His mother was appalled, and as she was still very popular with the people of Rome, she threatened to lend her support to Claudius' son Britannicus and put him forward as a more suitable candidate for the title of emperor. But Nero had not completely foregone his mother's influence, and he poisoned Britannicus at the next opportunity. Nero's affections then fell on Poppaea Sabina, an ambitious woman who wanted both Agrippina and Octavia out of the way. Nero knew that his mother was still popular with his people, 
so he arranged for an accident to dispose of her altogether. First, he attempted to poison her, but this was not her first rodeo, and he really should have known that she would have carried an antidote. Next, Nero tried to have Agrippina's bedroom ceiling collapse on her, but again, she survived. He then had a self-sinking pleasure barge constructed for his beloved mother, but she was able to escape and swim to shore. Eventually, he just had assassins attack and kill her. Then, his mistress, Papea of Sabina, became pregnant. Nero divorced his wife and married Papea, banishing Octavia to a remote island on a false charge of adultery. But Octavia had been as popular as his mother, and parades calling for her return simply made Nero more determined to eliminate her altogether. In 62 CE, at the age of 22, Octavia was bound, forced into a Roman suicide ritual, and drowned in a hot bath. Her decapitated head was then sent to Nero's new wife. You might be wondering what all this has to do with the burning of Rome. Well, after this, Nero realized he could do whatever he wanted, and he wanted to be an artist. He threw himself into poetry, acting, charioteering, and playing the lyre. He began performing in public, scandalizing himself in the eyes of the Romans, who felt that their emperor should act with more dignity and decorum. Nero's reputation was at an all-time low when, in 64 CE, a fire raged through the city. Historians still dispute the details of the fire, but it is thought that it either started in the slums south of Palatine Hill or the stalls outside the Circus Maximus, Rome's massive chariot stadium. The fire raged uncontrollably for six days, burning the houses of the rich and poor alike. In the chaos, people looted where they could, and by the time the fire was out, 10 of Rome's 14 districts have been completely wiped out. Hundreds of Rome's inhabitants died, with thousands more homeless. Many stories circulated about Nero's involvement in the burning of Rome, the most famous being that he played the fiddle while Rome burned. Another older story is that Nero climbed atop the city walls, dressed in theatrical garb, and recited an epic poem about the destruction of Troy. It was said that he was so moved he wept as he performed the poem. But it was Nero's actions after the fire that started the rumor that he had ordered arsonists to set a light to Rome. Far from lamenting the destruction of the empire's capital, Nero took full advantage of the situation. It was well known that Nero did not like the look of Rome, and as soon as the fire was out, he began to reconstruct the city in a Greek style, designing a new palace called the Golden House that would cover a third of Rome. His grand designs caused many to suspect he had destroyed Rome in order to indulge his own artistic aesthetic in the same way that he had disposed of his mother and wife. Nero placed the blame squarely on the Christians, a handy scapegoat with a reputation for engaging in wicked practices. This maltreatment initiated later Christian persecutions and gained Nero the title of being the first antichrist. Most of this information comes to us through ancient historians who are trying to paint Nero in a bad light. But how much of it is true? Well, for start, fiddles weren't invented back in ancient Rome, and if he was playing anything, it was most likely that it was a sitara, a forerunner of the lute, from which the modern guitar evolved. The idea of the 26-year-old Nero strumming his proto-guitar while waxing lyrically about Troy and watching his city burn might be closer to the truth if Nero hadn't been relaxing at his holiday villa in Antium at the time. Yep, that's right, Nero was nowhere near Rome when the fire started. Of course, that may be a handy alibi for someone who had ordered Rome's destruction. Still, modern historians now agree that stories about Nero burning Rome were most likely inventions of later Roman historians trying to discredit Nero's rule. In fact, many now believe that Nero did everything he could to aid the people of Rome during this tragedy. Despite being over 30 miles away from Rome, Nero rushed to the city as soon as he heard about the fire. He led rescue efforts opening up the palace and public buildings and creating temporary structures to accommodate those fleeing the blaze. He brought in food supplies and lowered the price of corn to make it more affordable. It has even been suggested that the scale of the fire was also exaggerated due to anti-Nero sentiment following the disaster. Given that Nero had aided many people, what was it that drew their scorn? Well, the first thing was that he caused the aristocracy to lose money. Rome had to be rebuilt and for that, Nero needed money. He increased provincial taxes, which would have impacted the rich estate owners. 
However, this wasn't enough to fund the extravagant and expensive rebuild Nero had in mind. So he also began issuing coins that were only 80% silver, with the rest of the weight made up of copper. He did this to keep as much silver as possible for his building projects. But while new coins were 20% copper, Nero still insisted on taxes being paid in pure silver, which meant that while tenants were paying their rent with debased coins, the estate owners still had to pay Nero with pure silver. And then there were the plans for Nero's new palace. It was to be the most lavish building Rome had ever seen, encompassing multiple buildings, gardens, orchards, vineyards, and an artificial lake. The rooms were to be decorated with golden gems, with ivory ceilings, and filled with the scent of perfumes. Nero even had a rotating dining room designed. However, this grandiose structure was not intended for personal use, and there is evidence that Nero wanted it to be a public space as well as a palace. Unfortunately for Nero, his passion for performance and willingness to take money from the aristocracy led to revolution, military revolt, civil war, and uprisings across the Roman Empire. So, although Nero may not have literally burnt Rome, his megalomaniacal flippancy still led to a great deal of carnage. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about Nero, check out our book, Nero, A Captivating Guide to the Last Emperor of the julio claudian Dynasty and How He Ruled the Roman Empire. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you found the video captivating, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.